We're going to see why human endogenous retroviruses matter, but before that, what are human endogenous retroviruses and how did they become an important part of human DNA? A retrovirus does not have the ability to replicate itself. It needs to use a host cell's DNA to integrate itself and use a cell's machinery to replicate. This process leaves a copy of the retrovirus insertion in the DNA of the infected cell. Now, if the infected cell is a germline cell and it is later fecundated, the copy from the viral infection will be present in the DNA of every cell of the descendant. And this is how viral DNA becomes endogenous to the DNA of the host. And it is a process common to most living beings. Over time, a species will be confronted repeatedly to new infections, and this process will continue many, many times over, resulting in the presence of multiple endogenous virus copies in the DNA of the host. This natural process started at the time of our primate ancestors, but it continued with evolution. Humans were and are still exposed to retroviruses, endogenizing new copies into our DNA, and as a result, 8% of human DNA is composed of remnant copies of viruses that contaminated our ancestors. This compares to about 3% of our DNA made of so-called classical genes, which is the area of focus of most genetic analysis. Today we know that there are over 30 families of human endogenous retroviruses in our DNA, each repeated hundreds and thousands of times all over our genome. And we are starting to understand from the pioneering work of Genuro and others that they may play a major role in health and disease. One of the particularities that make herbs so interesting is that they introduce a big genomic diversity within the human populations. When we look at the copies of human endogenous retroviruses in our DNA, we observe that there is a legacy that is common to the entire human race, much like classical genes, which are located on the same chromosomes in all individuals. They are a shared heritage from our common ancestry. Here, we can see vertically different human populations African, European, etc., and horizontally, common genes from one of these HERF families, in this case, HERF K. These sequences are common to all mankind, but not all HERFs are common to all of us. In fact, a great number of HERF K copies are non ubiquitous and unevenly distributed between the different human groups, probably reflecting the different environments to which our different ancestors were confronted to. And even within the same human group, there are many interpersonal variabilities making our HERF signature unique. And the work done for HERF K is now being repeated with sequences of other HERF families like HERF W represented here. This diversity may be the basis for understanding why the prevalence of autoimmune diseases is so different between human populations. For example, no classical gene may explain why multiple sclerosis has a much higher prevalence in Caucasian populations than in the other human groups. Another important discovery made on HERVs is the mechanism for their expression. If thousands of HERV genes were producing viral proteins all the time, we would simply not be alive. Thus, evolution has provided us with several mechanisms to repress the expression of proteins by HERVs. In an unpathogenic environment, HERVs should not be expressed. But what we also know today is that when a virus from our environment infects a cell, the replication mechanism it uses will wake up some of his HERV cousins in our DNA that will also then be able to encode for proteins. The proteins encoded by HERVs have generally changed through evolution from their original viral template, affected by sequence changes and deletions over time. But some individuals have HERV sequences that may still encode for active viral proteins, which will trigger a reaction from our immune system. As they are encoded by our own cells, they are not recognized as foreign, but still provoke a response, an innate immune response. HERVs may provide the missing link between viral infections 
and autoimmune diseases. We know epidemiologically that autoimmune diseases are very closely associated with viral infections, like Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, in all multiple sclerosis patients, or Coxsackie virus in type 1 diabetes. But these are very common viruses. EBV infects 90% of the world population, but 90% of the world population does not develop MS, thankfully. Only people with HERF copies encoding for active proteins may develop MS. While all MS patients are positive for EBV, they also have HERFW proteins in their brain. The pathogenic envelope protein of the HERFW family, abbreviated PHERFWOV, was the first HERF protein discovered back in the early 90s. It was isolated in post-mortem biopsies from multiple sclerosis patients. Since then, there have been many studies in Europe and North America confirming that this protein is consistently found in the brain lesions of MS patients, from the earliest to the latest stages of the disease. It is mainly found on microglial monocytic cells which belong to the innate immune system. This protein is very specific to demyelinating lesions in MS. It is not found in brain samples from patients that had other neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or stroke. As we will see in our next presentation, there is today very strong evidence that this pathogenic protein plays a core role in the mechanisms that drive the progression of disability in multiple sclerosis.